Node can be fast and efficient, but did you know it's single threaded by default? That means it uses just one CPU core, even if your machine has multiple. Let's look at how we can change that and make our apps faster and more scalable by using node clustering. Also, at the end of this video, I'll be showing you a tool that's built on top of node clustering that's going to make this process much easier. Before we jump into that, though, if you like coding tutorials like these and you want more, consider subscribing. And if you like reading articles on building and scaling software, check out the Hacking Scale newsletter. I'll leave a link to that down in the description below. But now let's jump into node clustering. So before we look at the code, I'm going to quickly explain the what and why of clustering. And here we have the traditional method where Node is going to create a process on a single CPU core, even if the machine you're running has multiple. So when we handle our incoming requests, they're all going to that Node instance on that single core. But if we change this and we use the cluster module, what we do is we create multiple instances of our Node application, one on each of the cores. And then all of the incoming requests actually go through what's called the primary, which is essentially going to act as a load balancer. And it's going to use something like a round robin approach, and it's going to pass all of the requests to these different processes in a nice and well-balanced way, spreading out the workload. So if we have these four requests coming in here, you can see each one goes to an individual Node instance and an individual CPU core. This way, you're balancing your load workload a lot more across your CPU, and you're also able to handle way more as we now have loads of different instances on different CPU cores. So with that quick explanation, let's take a look at the default node behavior with a simple application here using Express. So this application has one endpoint, which is just read content here. And you can see in this endpoint, all I'm doing is reading a file called content.txt, and it's going to return the send data here. So if I open up the terminal and I now run my application, this is going to start on localhost 3000 as it's an Express app here. Now, if I open up a new terminal, let's just try and curl that endpoint for now so we can see if it's actually returning what we want. So if I do localhost 3000 slash read dash content like so, we get back the contents of that file and that says content read from a file, subscribe to better stack. So it's a file with some really good information in it. Anyway, now that we've got that, what we can actually do is obviously that was just a single request there and the single thread handled that really nicely. But we can actually load test this using a tool called Autocannon, which is really good for HTTP requests like this. So to do that, what we can do is we can do MPX, then we can do Autocannon like so, dash D, this is gonna be the duration. So we're gonna do 10 seconds of a test. Then we're gonna do render status codes like this. And then you type the endpoint that you want to essentially test. So for this, again, we're going to be using that localhost 3000 slash read and then dash content like so. Now, what this is going to do when I hit enter is it's going to send thousands and thousands and thousands of requests to this endpoint here and essentially test. And we can see some stats on the latency as well as just how many requests it was able to handle. So I'm going to hit enter here. And obviously this is going to take around 10 seconds to complete. But once we've done that, we're going to be paying attention just to the total number of requests that we got back. And we're going to compare this later when we add in clustering to see how many more we improve by. So here you can see it was able to handle 22,000 requests in 10 seconds, which is pretty good. But obviously this was a very simple application. So you can imagine if this was more CPU intensive task, which clustering is very good for, that could be a much lower number. And again, you have some stats on your latency here. And it shows us that all of them had a 200 code. So all of the requests did succeed in reading that file and returning it. But as I said, the number we're caring about here is that we had 22,000 requests. So this is the number that we've got to beat. So let's keep that in mind. And now let's look into how we can actually cluster this application. So to do that, the first thing we're going to need is essentially that code that's going to set up that primary that I showed you earlier to send off all of those requests to different node instances. To do that, I'm going to create a file and I'm going to call it cluster.js. Now in this file, this is where, as I said, we're defining that code for all of those different instances. The first thing we're going to do is get the amount of cores on that CPU. So we can do CPU count like so. And then Node actually has a very helpful function called available parallelism like this. And you can import that from Node OS like so. And essentially what this does is it gives you an estimate of the amount of CPU cores that are available for parallelism, like it says there. And essentially you're going to want to use this one over just the raw CPU count as not all of your cores may be available for this and maybe they're taken up with another application. So this is going to be the best function for getting how many cores are actually available to Node to use for some of your instances. The next thing we need is just some code to get the directory name. So for this, we're going to do const directory name. That's going to equal directory name like so. And then it's going to be path to file URL to path like so. 
then import.meta.url. Essentially, all this is doing is just getting the current directory name that we're in. So this is just one of the methods that you could do it. We're going to be using this later because we need to tell it to load our index.js application. So now that we've got that, one thing you may want to add is you want to add in what the primary ID is or the primary process ID. So here we can say primary PID, and then we can just log out using our template literal. And then what you can do here is just say process this isn't the template literal, you do it that way, you can say process.pid like so. And now that we've got that, that's just generally quite good for debugging as you know what the process ID of your primary application is that's sending it off to all your other node instances. And you'll see we'll use this later as we'll also log out what the process ID is of the worker instances. So now we've got that, we can actually set up our cluster. To do this, we're gonna import cluster from node, make sure we spell that correctly, import cluster, from node and then cluster, like so. Now that we've got that imported, we can use it. And this is where we're gonna be setting up our primary. So we can now do cluster and then dot setup primary, like so. And inside of here, we're gonna have an object which is gonna have some of our cluster settings on it. Now the cluster setting that we're gonna be using is just the exec, so this is what it's gonna execute. And as I said earlier, we're gonna use that underscore underscore directory name there. And then in this directory, we're gonna be running our index.js. Because as I said, this is the worker that's essentially gonna load this index.js code onto all of our different CPU cores or our different processes. So we're still loading our index.js code here that we've got, but we're using it in cluster.js. We'll load cluster.js first using node. And then this is going to spin up our index.js application here and handle all of that logic. Now that we've got this set up though, we do need to define how many forks that we want to set up. And if you remember earlier, we defined this CPU count to say this is going to be the exact amount of worker instances we want to create. So we come down here and then we're going to use a for loop here. So we're just going to do let i equal zero here. And then i is going to be less than the CPU count like so. And then obviously I++, plus plus. so just a simple for loop over the amount of CPU counts that we have available to us. And then once you're in here, we can use a function called fork. So it's gonna be cluster.fork like so. As you can see from the dot fork description here, this is called from the primary process here, and it just adds a new worker process to your environment. So as I said, this is what's gonna run. If you have four cores, for example, it's gonna run four times, and it's gonna spin up a new node instance each time you run that. Now what we can do as well is we can add some graceful exiting code. And this is really useful for if one of your processes crashes, you can actually get it to spin back up again. So maybe that all of the requests start going to the other three cores if one of the core instances crashes. And then once it's been spun back up again, the requests can start going back to that. So that's another thing that clustering is really helpful for. To handle this, we need to look for the event. So we do cluster.on and then we can say exit. And then in here, what we can say is worker, you can get the code back as well, and you can also get the signal back. And then here, we'll just make this a function so we can start console logging. And then in here, I'll do console.log. Again, let's use a template literal. And we can say worker, and then we can come in here and you can now use that worker and we can get the process as well. And then you can get the process ID. So you can get a lot of information off of what worker gave that exit signal there. But we're gonna say this worker here, and then we'll say has terminated at the end of it, like so. And then you can also just add a really simple line here that says initiating, initiating replacement, like so. And then we can go ahead and use that cluster.fork that we used earlier to create a brand new instance. And it will use that CPU core that's just exited as there should be one available as, cause I just said, it, we have looked for when one is exiting. So this way you're gracefully handling, shut, handling shutdowns or crashes, and that way it should spin up a brand new instance. So we're actually ready to use this code now. So I need to go back and close out my other application that I had loading. I'm gonna clear this quickly. And now instead of using npm run start, I'm just gonna do node and then cluster dot js like so so it looks like we forgot an import up here so all you need to do is come up here and we can say import directory name like so from node path and hopefully now if i run node cluster dot js what we get here is we get the process ids of each of our worker instances here you get the process id of your primary instance here and then we get that it's all listening on port 3000 because as i said it's not going to be a different port per instance in our case 
all of the same port is going to be handled by four different instances of our index.js. As I said, these are our worker instances. So we are now utilizing clustering. So let's go ahead and run this test again. So I can press up in the terminal here and we get the exact same command we ran to stress test this one. 22,000 was the number to beat. And now if I hit enter on this and we went wait 10 seconds, this is now using clustering. It's gonna be hitting all of our different CPU cores with a new instance. It's gonna be hitting all of our four worker instances here with those requests, all being managed by this primary process here. And as you can see, we got 61,000 requests this time. So it's quite a big jump from that 22,000. And this truly is the benefit of clustering there. So there you go. That is the node cluster module and how you can start to use it. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you was a tool called PM2. So as you may have noticed in this cluster code here, it's actually fairly generic and you can imagine many people have created utilities like this and code like this. PM2 is a really good example of a utility that is built upon the node cluster module. It's gonna simplify scaling your applications by deploying all of those multiple processes across all of your available CPU cores and it's gonna efficiently distribute the requests. And of course, it's just gonna be able to handle all of those edge cases for you as it's a fairly well built up tool. Now, you don't actually need to install this in your application or anything. You can actually install this on the machine Machine that you're going to be running the actual instances on. So to do that, we can just do npm install dash g and then pm2 like so. Now, once pm2 is installed, we can go ahead and just do pm2 start. And then we're going to put in index.js because we don't need this cluster code anymore because essentially pm2 is a replacement for this and they've done all of the cluster code for you. So now we're just going to be using our index.js again. So the stuff that we actually wanted to run on that worker instance. So for this, we can just pass it index.js. And then the last bit is going to be the number of instances you want it to spin up. Now you don't have to define a number here. What we can do is we'll leave this as zero and zero is going to automatically do it for you based on the number of cores available on your machine, essentially. So if we now start up this application. You can see that we get out in the terminal. We get the PM2 has started. It's started up four different clusters here of our index application. And you see that online and they've got some CPU usage and some memory. So let's go ahead and benchmark this again, the same way we have been with the other ones. And if we run this, we should see some performance relatively similar to our cluster that we defined earlier using cluster.js. But as I said, they're handling all of the code for us and we don't need to do any of that code and handle any of the edge cases or anything like that. So as you can see here, we've got 61,000 again. So pretty much the exact same performance as we had using our own cluster JS code. But of course, PM2 is gonna be a big tool that has lots and lots of other features. And I highly recommend checking out the documentation. So I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. But as you can see, that's how you can get started with PM2 and it's a super awesome tool. Now, what you may notice is our terminal does exit out though. So if you do wanna shut down your PM2 instances, you can do PM2 delete all like that. And that will shut down your application. So there we go. We've seen how simple clustering is there to get started, whether writing your own code or using PM2. But let's discuss some of the challenges and considerations that we need to make when using clustering. The first thing is it's worth noticing that each process here is a complete separate instance on a separate core. That means they don't share that data by default, which does add some extra challenges to your application, particularly if it has session data or login data or something like that. Now, obviously, if you're using something like Redis or a database or anything like that, that will be better to handle your data and your state. Essentially, it's best to have this code handle as minimal state as possible as they can't by default talk to each other. Now you can actually message between instances and I'll leave a link to a blog post in the description down below that covers that. But as I said, by default, you wanna try and make sure that your node instances here or the code handles little state in them themselves and you're using something like a database or something like that instead, especially when it comes to applications with session, session data or login data or stuff like that. Another thing is that Node doesn't actually adjust to the number of CPU cores available, which is why we use that available parallelism function earlier to get the number of cores that we are able to use. But as you saw with PM2 as well, this is also able to handle that. So you may have better functionality using PM2, as I'm sure there's been code written into that tool to handle this a bit better. Otherwise, you can check out the Node documentation as well on the cluster and all things about that available parallelism function for how it determines the amount of cores that are available. Another thing worth noticing on that as well, though, is it's also worth saving an instance for your primary here, as we didn't do that in our code as we had four cores, but your primary is also another process that needs to run. So maybe if you had a lot of code in here, you'd want this on a separate instance as well. 
Lastly, monitoring and troubleshooting issues can become challenging when dealing with multiple work processes like this. To ease this process, consider using a logging tool such as Pino or Winston. This is going to really help you out to generate your logs, but it's also going to include some process specific details. So you can get all of the details on what process caused the errors and various different things like that. You could also consider aggregating these logs and forwarding them to a centralized location like BetterStack for really easy log analysis. So there we go, now you know a little bit more about node clustering, why we use it and what it does, as well as the cool tools like PM2 out there to ease that process further. If you wanna learn more about logging, like I mentioned at the end, check out this video here on Winston logging or watch this video here that YouTube is recommending. As always, please subscribe and thank you very much for watching.